goal is to bring you your next favorite band. Thanks for having us. This is a very cool show. Yeah, so we through many, yeah. many iterations, and it yeah. we finally landed on the weirdest one by far. Yeah, just a couple of feelings, and uh, boom, you got a song. Yeah. I, I remember this one time. I had been writing some songs, and I and I went out. This I'm just going right in on this story. I went out, and so I was. Ah, uh, okay, the story's longer than the song itself. We'll go ahead and play it. And listen, it's going to be everybody's favorite band. Welcome to your next favorite band. That's both the show title and our promise to you. We here at Stereophilia Studio are tireless in our pursuit of finding incredible, genre-defiant artists who are either a hot up-and-coming band or a group that has been delivering for years but have flown under the radar. Tonight, the beautiful melodies and harmonies of indie folk rock, the Jackson Pines. Each month, we will bring you live streams, audio podcasts, and perhaps even a live concert where you can listen to the stories and hear the music of artists personally curated by us based on what we feel will be worthy of your time. Be sure to subscribe and tune in to each episode because the possibilities are endless and you never know who will be your next favorite band. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome to another episode of your next favorite band. <laughs> we, we keep changing this thing up. Every I am time. your host, Philip Reese. I'm your co-host, David Moore. And uh, here we are, yet another Tuesday night. Yet another musician. And whatever night or day that you're listening to it, if it's the podcast, you have complete on-demand control at that point. So it doesn't have to be and a Tuesday. We're sort of pretending it's Tuesday, too. But that's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Peek behind the kimono there. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm listen. sure everyone <laughs> thought that this was all... <laughs> I mean, geez, the number of people behind the scenes to make this work. Let me tell you. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It's a, it takes a village. Um, but uh, but another incredible guest tonight. But uh, thought before we get into that, we could uh, spend a, a moment mm -hmm. to uh, reminisce, if you will. Uh, David and I did the uh, Poor Life Choices uh, concert this past week and saw Hotel Fiction. Mm -hmm. prior, yes, we did. Current favorite, I guess we could say, prior mm -hmm. inter interview. Yeah, we interviewed them. You go find the episode. I think it was roughly about a month ago. It was. It was yeah. a mid a mid uh, September banger, and then uh, the beaches. So it was Hotel Fiction in the beaches mm -hmm. at Dolphin Tavern, which Down was my first time in that venue in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yep, myself too. And thought it was a great venue. Thought it was a fun spot, and uh, um, but most importantly, I thought both artists put on incredible performances. They were they did not disappoint, and in fact, highly exceeded expectations. Yeah, it was it was a it was a great evening. I I thought um, Hotel Fiction were great. Um, you know, small stage, six people up on there. Yeah, that's uh, they, important to point out. Like, so uh, Jade and Jess were were obviously the front, um, but they had another keyboardist, a guitar, bass, and drums. So gave their sound more of what you catch on the record, or if you watch right. their videos. But as far as like, kind of like when you see it's the two of them, you think, oh, maybe just a duo. Guitar right, and, and they have performed some things online yes. like that, but this was the the full the full sound. Yeah, and it gave it uh, obviously it gives you the opportunity to do a whole lot more. So that was very yep. cool. And their <clears throat> their energy was great. They you know they they did different versions of things. They did obviously those extended solo type stuff, and it was very very fun. It was it had mm -hmm. a, definitely a fun aspect to it. And then um, then the beaches came out, and I think the beaches are rock stars already. Absolutely. Uh, I think you said it. They deserve to be on a stage about six times that big, which yeah, it was a like... tiny one. Don't get me wrong. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but and that's no disrespect to the Dolphin Tavern. That no, is a wonderful venue. It's just the size of what the venue is. But the beaches are just they are a rocket ship that is taking off. And uh, if you get the chance to see them or check them out, the music is great and their live show is even better. Yeah, they really it put on a great too. show. A little bit and of sassiness stayed... to them and they are yeah. just terrific. Well, and they sit and talk to everybody, and then the yep. line formed, and they, they spent the whole evening there basically talking to everybody, which was really, really great. So great. So great. Um, our hope is to bring them on the show. Obviously, we asked them in that moment, what are they going to say? No. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Plus, so they, 
Go ahead. Are you gonna... you know, we're one of a few people that talked to him that night, so hopefully... Uh... Yeah. No, what I mean is, we asked them, of course they're going to say yes, but obviously now we'll follow up and see if we can get that scheduled. Probably wouldn't be until the new year. Um, so yeah. uh, so there's time anyway. Uh, yep. But it, it would be very, very cool to, to chat with them because um, they just seem to have a really cool story. But uh, yep. the agree. other thing that was going on in town, which we were in the midst of, but seeing a show that had nothing to do with it was Philly Music Fest. Um, Mariel Kraft performed at that. Low Cut Connie performed at that. Um, a lot of other ones. Uh, it, I, it looks and feels like a great festival. And, and it seems to be around like that second week of, uh, of, of October every year. Mm -hmm. um, they do a networking thing that I would love to kind of be a part of. But anyway, um, wasn't able to make it work this year. But uh, there was a lot of great shows going on in and around all those same venues. Not just uh, uh, they were Dol Dolphin Tavern had some of the shows, but obviously World Cafe Live had some. Yeah, Ardmore, uh, Ardmore Music, Music Hall. Hall had some. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, Screaming Females performed. They were one of our favorites from Music Fest. Yeah, it was um, a, it's really a great build that they put together. Totally. Yeah, it's it's very, very cool. And it, it's very neat that it's around all of those different venues, too. Like, yeah, it's, on each it different makes a lot night, of sense. You You're be... seeing the city as well. along Yes. With yeah. The music. And it raises money for nonprofits. So like first, once yeah. the bands are paid. Then it goes to all the organizations that are like um, Girls Rock Philly, like we have Girls Rock, uh, Lehigh Valley Girls Rock, and mm -hmm. um, uh, some other very, very cool nonprofits that support the music industry. So um, that's another thing that I'm hoping to make sure that we support a little bit more next year by getting down there for some of that. But this year, it was just happened to be that we were going to see the beaches and hotel fiction at the same time. So that's the way it went Why down. These people talk to us about our schedule. Yeah. And the major, uh, like the closer of that whole festival is a band called the Tisberries. And that brings us to our, our guest for this evening, because they'll be on a bill with them uh, in November, uh, playing at the Grape Room. Uh, so the Tisberries will be playing with Jackson Pines, who we have on tonight. And, uh, and they just um, have a great sound. They're one of those ones, again, where you hesitate to put a genre on them. So I said in the beginning, indie folk, rock, whatever, but it's like, I could probably have added three more or four more adjectives to it, and I still wouldn't have really captured who they are and what they offer. So um, take those categories and if they bring value, great. If not, to throw them away and just enjoy the excellence of what uh, of what this band brings. So um, we have one of their songs to to kind of share. And the neat part about this one is it's a live a live recording, which I always love sharing in the first place. Um, and uh, and this particular song is called Hard Times in the Pines which that's where they get their name from. And we'll learn a little bit more about that, but uh, take a listen to some Jackson Pines and then we'll uh, share some bio and bring on Joe. This song's called Hard Times in the Pines and it starts with James Black on the bass. Santo Rizzolo on the drums. Roshane Kernerotny on the Wurlitzer. James Herman on the fiddle. Jackson Pines is a band from the Pine Barrens of New Jersey that now call Philadelphia home, consisting of singer, songwriter Joe McAvecki. Oh, I'm going to do it wrong. There, I knew I was going to do it. McAvecki. Uh, and stand-up bassist James Black, Jackson Pines, harks forward with melodies and rhythms from the past, combining minimalistic acoustic arrangements and taking cues from the ethos of folk, blues, and indie rock. Jackson Pines tells stories of hard times, overflowing love, disappointment, and hope. In 2017, they released Purgatory Road, produced by Simon Fleece, and Lost and Found EP to critical acclaim. Their latest full-length album, Close to Home, was released in July of 2021 and features a full band accompanying Joe and James' signature rhythms and melodies. So let some of this solo play out there. and And, uh, and welcome to the show, Joe McAvecki. 
Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. We're going to let that play. for stumbling over your name, even though I asked ahead of time on how to say it correctly. Yes, we can uh, vouch no for worries. David. Um, so we're going to let that play up in the corner there so we can get again. Anything you can share about this particular uh, performance or the song or anything yeah. else you want to share about the band? Yeah, I mean, this particular recording, um, for sure. So this is something we made for the Philadelphia Folk Festival in oh, 2020. Um, we've been lucky enough to play at the Philly Folk Festival in two different bands that we've been in over the years. Um, and every couple of years, we're lucky enough we get invited and we'd love to go and play for them. Yeah. Um, and this was 2020. So this was the first time the band had convened since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Wow. So what you're seeing here is the first time we were able to get together and play any music together since like February of that year. And this was shot in July for the August festival, which was totally done as a streaming event. So if you listen to that and you listen to some other versions, that might be one of the more energetic, raucous versions of what is sometimes, not always, uh, more kind of like laid back, sure, you know, jazzy folk tune. But what you're hearing in that recording is like the energy of like seeing your friends for the first time in like four or five months. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Especially when you're used to seeing some of those, maybe not all those, which they're all my friends, but Lee Sing James mm -hmm. and the fiddle player, whose name is also James, we used to see each other every single week and sometimes sure. every single day. Um, so that's kind of palpable in that take. That's very that. cool. Um, so yeah, they, they asked us if we would do a set for that. We made a five song uh, set, which you can still watch on our YouTube. It's called Live from the Philadelphia Folk Festival. And that's it's fun. a good representation of our uh, what we're like when we play a bigger show. So yeah, Jackson Pines is always at least a duo. Me and James Black on the stand-up bass. Right. We play many shows as a duo acoustic and many shows as a trio, us mm -hmm. and a drummer. But when we get a really, really important gig or a big enough gig, or if we are doing something that it calls mm -hmm. for this, we are sometimes as well, a quartet or a quintet. And, sure. Uh, we've done and you even did a solo like thing over at, uh, what was it, Rock's Young Porch Fest or something like that. It was just you, wasn't it? Yeah, actually, I played solo twice this weekend and then as the trio last Thursday in Asbury Park, New Jersey. So we're always kind of in a modular form, but 99% mm -hmm. of the time, it's at least me. Joe and James Black on the stand-up bass. That's the core of Jackson Pines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing all that. And thank you so much for coming on tonight. Yeah, thanks so much for having me and for being so flexible. I appreciate it. Oh, listen, our pleasure. Um, but uh, one thing we do typically try to do is, is kind of tell the story. And so obviously we the kind of cool to just go back to the beginning. Um, basically, from what I understand, you're from Jackson, New Jersey, which is near the Pine Barrens. And so that's where the name comes from. Yeah. Um, and then uh, if you don't mind just sharing a little bit about kind of like the music journey on how you um, landed on that and maybe how you and James met and, and kind of started this whole thing off. Yeah, absolutely. So me and James met in our hometown of Jackson, like you said, and it is it's not in. Well, 90 percent of the town is not in the protected Pinelands area, Got which it. is like, you know, a state government sure. orchestrated thing, which is a great thing. We're all about conservancy. Um, but. It is still a Pine Barrens town, even though it's on the northern fringes in the end of it. And we're not very creative when it comes to band names. So that just kind of seemed like an obvious thing. <laughs> it um, really works, though. Like, Yeah. And beyond the fact also name. that the content of, a, you know, not every single song we sing or write, but a huge part of what we do and the stories we tell is ingrained in where we grew up in that area. And also like our experiences when we left that area and started traveling around the country and playing in a band and all those differences and stories you hear and find out. So it just seemed like the right way to represent us as a band when we became that band. So when we were teenagers, um, I went to Catholic school. He went to the public school. But mm -hmm. there was a huge local scene in uh, Ocean County and Monmouth County, New Jersey. And there still is. Um, but at that time, in the mid-2000s, there were so many emo bands, hardcore metal bands, sure. punk bands. And James was a well-known punk bassist. He played electric bass in a bunch of bands that... We were all friends. We play the same shows. I had an indie rock band. And then eventually um, my high school band broke up. And when I was in college, I started to play more of a folk music and more traditional folk and more of my own original started being more influenced by folk music. And I had a trio of three singer songwriters called Thomas Wesley Stern. Um, and that was the name of the band. We confused a lot of people, but it was our three middle names because we all wrote and sang harmony. Uh -huh. And eventually we needed a bass player. And we asked if James would teach himself stand up bass. And he did just that. 
Uh, he borrowed a it bass. Sounds like an easy my... undertaking. Yeah, just learn, teach yourself how to do stand up bass. Yeah, we thought it would take <laughs> a couple months or a year, but within like a couple weeks, he was able to play a show with us. Like that's amazing. And he taught himself by uh, listening to his vinyl collection. He was the only wow. person I knew. This is before the vinyl thing came back all the way, like right. 2008. Like he had a huge country and R and B vinyl collection. Mm-hmm. Oh, he I bet just... he had some cool stuff. Absolutely. So he yeah. taught himself how to play to Hank Williams Senior Records yeah. and mm-hmm. Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys and all that kind of stuff That's and Aretha amazing. Franklin records, even though it was usually electric bass, he'd just play along. Sure. So that's kind of the roots of it. And then that band lasted for six years and we did a lot, a lot of work, recorded a lot of records. And then when that band naturally had its um, disintegration period, me and James decided and agreed to not stop. And uh, we kept writing new songs that were a little different, just me and him. Um, and that became Jackson Pines about five, six years ago. We've been doing that ever since. Yeah. So That's... when um, when that, uh, like when he's learning stand-up bass and when you're forming that other band, is that when you're learning, I just read this kind of interesting article that you were learning too, um, how to finger pick like Mississippi John Hurt. Yeah, I mean, around that time, it was just like a necessary kind of thing because of what we were writing, what we were doing. Um, that I started to play more of a finger picking guitar style. And actually it's due to a cassette tape that James, the bass player had in his old green F-150 when we were in high school, he had a copy of Mississippi John Hurt today. Uh, uh-huh. as the name of the record is today exclamation point. And it's still one of my favorite folk and blues records ever recorded. It's still my favorite Mississippi John Hurt record, even though I've heard a bunch of other ones that I love. Sure. The first exposure I had driving around town with him back in the day. Um, and yeah, I just started kind of learning from videos and things. And I don't play as well as him and I don't do things exactly the way he did. But that Piedmont uh, folk guitar style, which is a style that comes from, you know, the, the hilly regions, not the Appalachian high mountain music, which gives us bluegrass and other traditions. Sure. Not the lowland, low lying area blues music, which is a total delta is a totally different sound. Mm-hmm. These hill guitar players, turns out they have like their own style. And between him and Miss, um, him and Elizabeth Cotton, I kind of taught myself how to play this new way of picking the guitar that went really well with the way James plays the bass lines. And that's really the core of what our earlier band started doing. But now it's like the main core of what we do now. For sure. Very cool to get even just that little bit of a guitar playing history lesson there. That was very neat. Yeah, that yeah. is really neat to tie it also into the geography like that. I feel like we need a map overlay that yes. we need to like bring in to like, you know, zoom in. That would be great if we could do that. Alan right. Lomax made a map and in all of his research, he did plot out all the different things and songs he collected over, you know, decades around the whole country. And he really did have a theory that the geography impacted the singing and vocalization styles of the folk musicians, as well as the instrumental influences i'm sure and that up in the mountains you get that high lonesome sound of like mm-hmm. roscoe holcomb and it gets lower and slower and deeper when you get down more closer to where the rivers let out to the sea and it's never been you know you can't scientifically prove it but it does he bared a lot out in his research and somewhere sure. there is a map so you might be able to link to it i might actually have it in a book of mine too i could scan and send over so that would be so cool but yeah maybe it's even out there <laughs> what was the person's name lomax Alan Lomax was the one that did it. Alan Lomax. Um, definitely... And uh, he's known as being a collector. He helped preserve a lot of old folk music that we would have lost. He went around with a tape recorder and recorded it himself in the 30s, 40s, 50s, all that kind of stuff. My goodness. Yeah, yeah well, definitely. If we find anything, we'll definitely link to it here. That's very, very cool. I'll stuff. send you some stuff, too. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no, we'd love to have it. Um, and then your like uh, David included this in the beginning. But um, in 2017, you release not one, but two uh you know recordings one ep called lost and found and one album purgatory road um anything there as far as like like why that like was one held up or was one advanced because it was going to be so good like well no i mean we were just starting out as a new band after being in a band that we really believed in like i said for six seven years that took us across the country many times took us to europe and back um and we just really were like had all these new songs we didn't really know what to do um So we were lucky enough to get in touch with a member of a band that we looked up to since we were in high school and still look up to the Felice brothers who are from the Mm -hmm. Catskills of New York and a member of the band who he left the band about, I guess now it's almost 16 years or something, but he left the band and became a producer and he decided he heard some of my demos and I told him I had a band, but it broke up. 
and he messaged us back. I never thought it would ever happen. It was just a cold email. And in the industry, cold emails 99.9% of the time never get answered. And I'm mm-hmm. used to that. This mm-hmm. was that one time someone answered and it was him. And we went up to his barn in the Catskills and recorded a full length record. Um, and then we put it out. But the way it works is, you know, it takes a couple months to put out a record. So by the time that came out, we already had new songs. Right. And so we just recorded another record with a different friend of ours. And we had a tour. We were opening for a band from out west called Fruition. And they're a great band. They're still together. Mm -hmm. Um, They're like folky and jammy and like so talented singer songwriters. And we were like, we discovered that we played a show in New York City and someone told us, um, you're going to get an article in Billboard magazine from the show you just played, but you need to have something new to release or else they're not going to publish it. Like we're not going to write about someone who put a record out four months ago. Right, we're only right, going right. to write if you've got something coming out that week. Wow. So that is, I guess you're right. We did kind of advance that EP. We recorded it, mastered it quicker and put it out that week and then went on a tour for like just two weeks. But it was a really big deal for us because we sure. just started as a new yeah. band mm-hmm. and we got good acclaim. And so that we put those four songs out. So they would basically have something to write about. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's the industry is so funny that way. It's like, yeah, we want to do this thing, but only if like, exactly. Really? Right. It, it doesn't change the show. You just got inspired by. No. Or like the record we put out that was longer and more thought out. But hey, that's why it has been out EPs. for like four whole months. My God, that's so long ago. It's, yeah. It's going they were like, that's hair. passe. If we're yeah. going to put you out, it has to be exclusive. Yeah. And it was. And we're still glad because we still use that and it helps us get some of the great gigs we've been getting lately Um, because that's in our press kit. So we're grateful. I'm sure a a billboard link is a nice thing to have. (laughs) Doesn't hurt. No. No. Um, And is this when you win? So I saw there's some awards you guys won Asbury music award, Jersey acoustic music award. Is that coming off of the heels of these releases? Um, Some of those. Yeah. Like we won one in the beginning of the band and then we won a couple of those. Obviously they knew us because we'd been in that former band, but both bands were acoustic. So they kept an eye on us and we were still kind of working in those circles at that time. So yeah, the jam awards, they don't happen anymore. Unfortunately, they were the Jersey acoustic music awards and Asbury park music awards. Those don't happen anymore either, but I think they might come back. But COVID Mm kind of put the kibosh on a lot of those local award ceremonies, which have their own share of funny, like Seinfeldian moments, even though I just said kibosh. But like they're (laughs) they're political and weird. But also we appreciate being recognized by our community because we are nothing without our local scenes and our local communities. We wouldn't be able to have the courage to go on a New England tour or go to Nashville like we do if it weren't for the Philadelphia local scene or the Asbury local scene or starting to get into, you know, your local scene up there, which, mm-hmm. you know, Music Fest has helped us do over the last couple of years. So, sure. you know, again, I can make fun of the award ceremonies, but it's great to have local scenes because not every area has them. Mm, no, no, you're absolutely right. And I think we are un- not unique. We are uh, lucky to have that because yeah. when I do go to obviously Nashville's one and Austin is one and there's other places too but Bethlehem and you know into New Jersey down to Philly like even if you insulate it from New York City which clearly has its own thing we've got enough here to make a local scene where people can really find some live music whether it's you know stadiums but also the more smaller venues and then even just dive bars there's lots of really really cool music going on all around here there's some really talented bands playing in the bars and the smaller music yep. rooms up there with by you guys. Yeah, just as much as down here. It's sure. amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Purgatory Road does have a song, and uh, I have it queued up here, um, even when I'm gone. And I kind of wanted to let that be another song that we kind of put out there for people uh, to enjoy and and soak in as, as another kind of version of, of what you guys play. So I don't know if you want to set this up a little bit, and then we'll let it play, and we can even bring you back on, like, again, but... Kind of yeah, so this is from the recording we did in the Catskills with Simon Felice. It's the first song we recorded with him. Uh, we did it all in two weeks, but it's the first one we tackled. It's the first one he wanted to do. Um, and it was recorded with the barn doors open, kind of like nice. a Neil Young record in the 70s. That was like our dream is to record that way. You might even be <laughs> able to hear a little bit of rain in the recording in the background. If you listen closely at the end, I'm not sure. Right. But that first record's the whole kind of thrust of it. And it's something that we still do to this day, even though some of our new records are more full band, is it just showcases me and James playing yep. and me singing. And that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's our sound. Awesome. Well, here is Even When I'm Gone by Jackson Pines. I should have started up because I knew there was this long O. <laughs> Oh, 
to me Help me see the things I cannot see Help me be the man I could not be Even when I'm gone Walks with me Learn the steps and carry on with me Shoot the moon right through with the used to be Even when I'm gone And I will dance with thee Even when I'm gone You're These songs, like, it took me a long time It has such a familiarity to it, like I feel like I've heard it before, even though it, I haven't. And I think that's just a testament to the songwriting and the beauty of just like how it's putting you in a headspace that it's like, so I, I don't want to use the word relatable, but it's like, I don't know. It just creates this like nostalgia around something that it's very familiar, but it's the first time I'm ever experienced it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's the way it was for me. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, the for songs like this, every different songs have different goals. But a lot of the time, you know, when you're writing a song, especially like where I'm coming from, a lot of my songs tend to be confessional songwriting. So like there's certain things that are pulled from real life. There's certain stories I'm telling that are real that might be really about me or about someone I know closely. Mm -hmm. The goal is always how do you tell a story about something really specific about someone or yourself, but take away, strip away all the things that make it necessarily only yours and leave sure. only the things that make it everyone's. Um, and it has to do with keeping the lyrics simple, but also has to do with like saying what you really mean and feel. And this song, more than anything we've released, has had the biggest response, even though it's the first song off our first record. I'm not ashamed to say that people still like it the most mm -hmm. because people say like, oh, this song, like it was played at like yeah. my husband's funeral. We've mm -hmm. played at people's pre-funeral events. We've played at people's weddings. We just played this at someone's wedding two weeks ago. Uh, just outside of New Hope on the Delaware River at a wedding and we they were like we so our first dance was to this four years ago and that's like really what the music is for at the end of the day like there's all this commercial stuff and there's all these hopes of being able to live solely off playing music which sure. is important but really at the end of the day you just want something that people relate to and that could feel like it's theirs the same way that all of our favorite music feels like it's ours sure so many musicians and artists have done that for me over the years so just have one person say this is my wedding song or this reminds me of my deceased father or my deceased son um which happens a lot with that song um right. it's just a special thing and it's just testament to i think um from a technical standpoint keeping it really simple musically like it's just me and him and it's not a lot of flash going on it's just us playing yeah. And then from a more, you know, philosophical standpoint, it's um, just like I said, keeping the essential human experience center in the song as opposed to the, all the details. Mm -hmm. um, although detailed songwriting is super important. Um, but also I have one correction to make because I thought you were going to play the album version. Oh, that was God. not Simon Felice's house. I just want to say that's James's house. <laughs> and that's where we practice and rehearse and where we recorded our whole last record in that room. And that was our a music video we shot with our friend Anthony Yebra, who's a great uh, videographer sure. in the music industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I found that version of it and it was just such an, I thought it was a very, very cool shot. Oh, I agree. I just yeah. set it up wrong. So now, now you have the right, now you have the right context. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And uh, you were talking about songwriting there, especially you know, yeah. honest songwriting and stuff. David had a good question for this, so I figured it was a good spot for that. Yeah. Please. Well, yeah. So we were talking about this. Phil and I were talking about this when we were discussing having you on. And <clears throat> so a lot of artists have their methods for songwriting. They um, they do jam sessions. They write books of poetry. All those kind of things. Your songwriting is very evocative. There's very like you said, there's a, there's a simplicity, but to get to simplicity is very difficult. Uh, it's not just simple in its own, it's simple in simplicity necessarily aren't necessarily the same thing. So right. I'm intrigued what your process looks like. What, how do you, is it music first, then words? Is it words and music? Cause you also have a background as a writer. So I'm really intrigued by how that all comes together for you guys. Yeah. So the first thing is it is, a band where the songs do start with me primarily. It's not our older band was three songwriters and we always wrote everything together. 
almost like always live in the room um, was that method. So this band is very different in that. But before I had that band, I always wrote by myself. I always wrote songs. I started trying to write songs when I was like nine. I started trying to record songs using two boom boxes that were facing each other so I could track over when I was like 11. Mm -hmm. And then my dad bought me my first eight track mixer when I was like 12. And that like I took off from there. <laughs> I was I would spend more time in my bedroom on the weekends recording. Other people were playing baseball or going to parties and stuff. And I would just be in my bedroom recording myself. And I was really into that generation of indie musicians like bedroom pop, like Neutral sure. Milk Hotel and Bright Eyes and all the people that recorded stuff themselves. You know, so I was trying to do that even as at the young age. So when that band dissolved, I was okay going back to that form. Mm -hmm. So I the songs come up just in myself. Um and they happen all different ways, honestly. But more often than not, words happen before music. But when the sure. words are happening, because I also do write poetry. And although I, I think that poetry is very lyrical and can be very lyrical, but also sometimes isn't. Mm -hmm. And lyrics of music can be very poetic, but also isn't always poetic. Sure. I really believe there's a hard separation between lyrics um, and poetry. Yeah. Although they influence each other. So when I'm writing a poem, which I do very often, um, and I'm going to put a book of poetry out for the first time actually soon um, through a Philadelphia um, indie publishing house, which I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm writing a poem, it's a poem and I'm typing it or I'm writing it in a notebook, um, which is funny because I'm doing the same thing when I'm writing a song, actually. But the difference is whether I'm typing or writing in that notebook, when it's a, a lyric of a song, I might not know the exact chords, but the rhythm is stronger in what sure. it is. And it's already got a built-in cadence to it. So mm -hmm. it's more like a Shakespearean sonnet, which again are not lyrics. That's a poem. But those are very, <laughs> very lyrical poems, the sonnets. They're right. song-like. That's what sonnet means, a small mm -hmm. song. Right, right, right. They're also maybe arguably intended to be sung, although we don't mm -hmm. have the music, right? right? So it has this pulse. Um, and I know it's a song. I know it's not a poem. And also a song is just a different, a different machine, right? It has a different thing. Like it has to have... When writers talk about a hook. A hook could be the most catchy part of a song. And that's what pop writers talk about, the hook. But for a songwriter, like a singer-songwriter, kind of like the tradition I come from more, a mm -hmm. hook is like a reason that the song exists. Sure. Mm -hmm. Like, sure. why is it a song? Like, even when I'm gone, it exists because that is a central pillar that every other line in the song is coming and branching off of that, whether it's idea-wise or you know, um, concept wise, which are a little different, like, mm -hmm. or just word wise, right? You have all these different branches coming off of that. And that's what makes it a song is that feeling felt good enough to represent. Um, so then I do this and I write all these songs and most of them stink and most of them don't go anywhere <laughs> past the notebook or go past the computer. No, I just love the for humility. Real. That's amazing. Joe has I mean, an entire for... concept album based on the Pac-Man fever song from his uh, youth <laughs> that mean... he's not sharing with anybody at this point in time. I mean, there's things that are not that different from that. Honestly, <laughs> like there are some weird things. Like, and so James's job too is that he is a great filter, and he's a great one at pulling out like what are the special songs. Mm, sure. And I'll know in general which ones are better than others. But there's still some times where I'm kind of you know on the fence, and one I might not necessarily think is that great. He'll be like, no, that's one we should be working on. And then the final part of the process is me and him finalize the music together. Sure. But again, I will admit that I will, you know, I start all the chord progressions and I pick the key and I pick the main chords. But James is bass playing. He writes all his own bass parts. And sometimes if he wants to go somewhere, I might have to change my chord a little bit sure, so that right. note he hears fits in. And I think it's good too. Um, so he's in the final, you know, stage of the musical arrangement. Although I do kind of compose the songs first by myself, but nothing gets past James. And he has to be like really, really excited about something for it to get recorded let alone played live. So that's sort of the process. <laughs> that's very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, so a lot of stuff that. that hits the editing room floor. So many, you know, files that I look back, I'm like, when did I write that? It's weird. Or sometimes <laughs> like, oh, when I write that, let's bring it back. And we end up recording a song sure. from our earlier band that never made it. And it's just, right. there's all that stuff happening because I write, you know, too much. <laughs> no, it's, I think... The prolificness is important because, you know, you, you never know when that, uh, you know, uh, what would be the right term, when that creative spirit's going to strike, you got to be there to capture it, uh, you know, because yeah. it'll, how many times do you have, you know, an idea or in your case, probably a song where if you didn't write it down right away, 20 minutes later, it's just, you couldn't remember it. 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's the reason why like, I don't, I have like three of these in my backpack <laughs> and I always have a moleskin because these don't, the batteries don't die on this. No, right. This right. thing, and I do like, you know, voice memos are great. And so we're typing in the phone. I use that too, an email, sure. email yourself. But this is like the reason why so many things don't get lost because you just, I always have a pen. I always have yep. one of these, but um, you know, that's, that's just sort of the, the, the idea of the songwriting. And one of the other things I do is I run a songwriting um, group. And what I do is people just share their songs every week. And every week I give them a prompt. Um, and it's like, if you don't have an idea, you can use the prompt to try to write something new and other, you sure. don't have to follow it. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing about that, you know, there is some kind of lightning strike sometimes, and there mm -hmm. is such thing sometimes as like the muse that visits you, sure. but it never does. And it never will often, unless you make a practice of writing when you don't want to yep. write and writing mm -hmm. often. And just, you know, some people have to have a class like the one I teach where on Wednesdays you're like, oh crap it's it's 4 p.m and i have to do this at six so i gotta mm -hmm. figure something out and right. for others it happens kind of more organically but you know i really believe in having to keep doing it and especially writing through a song that you're not liking sure and finishing it yep. because i there's so many songs that are on our albums maybe even even when i'm gone although i'm not sure about that one it could be where i couldn't have written the song that makes the album if i didn't write the one before it that i threw out but really mm -hmm. it just lives on a hard drive so I believe in writing through a song, even if you don't like it, because to finish it means you're ready to write the next one, which could be yep. the best one you ever wrote. So, yep. yeah, I think that's a good, I really, I mean, the point about the inspiration or having that moment of, of what you feel like is, oh, I've lifted something to a higher level is mm -hmm. also what you're talking about is you got to do the exercises, yes. you know, that as is referred to, I've heard a lot of this referred to in like the creative writing context, you have to do the butt in the chair time, you have mm -hmm. to sit down in front yes. of it and do that part where it's like uh, i have no inspiration to write this short story well let's do it four o'clock anyway <laughs> right. yeah. you know so you've got to yeah. do it and those are the things that you build also some of the mu the, the infamous muscle memory it's the same thing that happens when you're learning a music instrument you know that same sure. sort of Absolutely. thing where you 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 stop thinking the this is an a e major this is an a minor this is instead your fingers are like oh i need this tone and it just shows up because those memories are now there right you get to kind of lift like you say you kind of can separate into a new um, it's like a different level of the atmosphere. You go right. up into a higher level where you can kind of keep the one going on its own. You can start thinking about more, yeah, melody or concept, or even, like I said, just finishing something because luckily a song, you know, I do write short stories myself too sometimes. And man, a short story, when you spend all the time and get to the end and still don't like it, it feels like such more of like a, a wounded like failure <laughs> but it's <laughs> right. not because the right. thing about a song now also i know people that think about songs for a year before they even show one person the song mm -hmm. but like for me a song is kind of like it's like oh it only took me like you know a day if i throw it away it's fine like to, tomorrow's another day short stories are a little more it take yeah. a little more effort a little more investment time. right but i would say the same thing though is that you know that short story you if you could finish it and find a way to finish it it might help you finish the best one you wrote later on um because they're all just kind of puzzles at the end of the day. I think sure. Tom Waits, Tom Waits said that a great song is like a bagel. It's like it's it's not too big, but it's not too small. It fits in the palm of your hand, and when it's done, you wish there was just a little bit more. <laughs> and that's I kind of try to take that into my songwriting process. It's a pretty solid description. That is pretty great. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's amazing um so actually i'll just quickly touch on some of the other releases and sure. uh if you can just maybe so in 2019 there's another ep called gas station blues and diamond rings which i love yeah. the title of that one is amazing oh, thank you and then 2021 was the uh, more recent again the highly acclaimed uh, close to home yeah. um the only reason why i'm getting through those a little more quickly is uh you know, I want to I want to make sure we give you time. You, you, you're you going to be gracing us with a performance tonight. Sure. So uh, but anyway, uh, on those, anything to touch on in particular to, to kind of either feature or, or kind of give people some details behind either Gas Station Blues or, or Close to Home? Yeah. I mean, so we did the EP right after we released the first album and it was for the article that came out. And then, you know, we started playing a lot of shows and traveling around primarily the northeast and the south. Um that's where we mainly play, um, of course, the tri-state um, area of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York being our main regional operation. But mm -hmm. then like this summer, we went into New England for a while. Uh, we usually go out south and down into the Midwest, um, but haven't since COVID. So we're going to be doing that next year. Um, so we did all that kind of stuff. And then the next year kind of just kind of rolled by so fast that we were like, we got to put something out. But um, 
it was one of those time periods where I got to be honest, I just didn't feel confident in um, a lot of the material that I was writing mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff that even if James liked that I kind of still wasn't giving it my vote at the end of the day. Um, so instead of making a full record, we just decided to take the five strongest songs and to make an EP again with the same person. Right. So not Simon, the EPs were both done by Eric Case Romero in mm -hmm. his studio in um, on the Jersey Shore in Monmouth County. Um, and he's he's a great engineer. He has his own music. He's also the touring guitar player in the Front Bottoms, a huge pop punk band. Um, and he's a great, great person in our scene and our little community of our friends as well. Um, so we went back to him to just do another one. And he really made me feel better about the writing and about the songs. Um, kind of like got my confidence back. Um, so we recorded those again, just in his basement. Um, we like to do recordings in sessions, you know. Um, there's nothing wrong with recording things over months and a long period of time. Um, and with everybody in separate rooms at separate times, but we really like to record live. Like we were listening to our records. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Not every single song on every record, but on Purgatory Road, you're hearing me and James play together in a room. It's no separation. There's no time separation. Um, when you're listening to the EPs. You're hearing the same exact thing, just in a different studio. Um, so we went back and we tracked those. I think the only thing we didn't do live were the drums on that record. So the EPs, the purpose of them were to kind of take us from the almost totally acoustic, but not completely acoustic Purgatory Road record, probably like 80% acoustic and two or three songs, maybe 70% have a little drums on it. Um, and then each of the EPs have a little more instrumentation on them. I start to, you might hear me play a little lead guitar on Lost and Found on Gas Station Blues and Diamond Rings. There's a little more drums. Um, so they're kind of transitional albums that weave together what we're doing on Close to Home and Purgatory Road. Very cool. Um, and it was kind of always designed that way. Because um, if we were going to put out a mostly acoustic album, then drop a full band one, we wanted there to be a little bit of a some breadcrumbs and a path along the way to kind of show you how we get there. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, to not just completely Dylan people, although we're not that full of ourselves. But uh, <laughs> not, many, not that many people listen to the records yet. But, um, you know, you kind of... You, you transition into a more uh, indie rock sound or folk rock even, but from a way more acoustic folk sound originally. Sure, 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 sure. That's very cool. And and it's neat that there was uh, a lot of intentionality with the design there of, of the different uh, kind of formats and, and the kind of the, the tone and the sound of each one of those. Yeah. Um, and, and so then we did Close to Home, you know, um, last year and then put that out. And that was recorded all in that room that the Even When I'm Gone video, for oh, those who are cool. watching, those in the audio format can maybe watch it later. Mm -hmm. But for those that are seeing it, you know, that's the room. We set the whole thing up like a studio and it was after an entire nine ten months of covid again we did that session and then didn't really play together again for another like eight months wow uh the one you heard before hard times yep. and pines so we found a time where after the hall after new year's eve everyone was willing to quarantine for 14 days just like a preemptive one just sure. to make sure no one could right? do anything yep. and we then we tested this is still two three months before the vaccines came out yep no i know yeah. exactly uh, the time so, you're talking about so we just did it though and we spent a whole weekend at james's house and we tracked the whole record mostly live full band just in his house um, and we had a really great time doing it. And this is the full kind of combination because there's still songs on the record that are just me and James. Mm -hmm. There's some that are just me by myself, but now you're getting a little bit more of that full band, and especially more of like drums, which is when we play live now, we're very often a trio that will still do a few acoustic songs. Um, but very often we'll spend most of our set playing, you know, with drums and all that kind of thing, even though James will still mainly play stand up bass and I'll still mainly play acoustic guitar. Uh, occasionally we'll both pull out the electric for the right song. If that's what it, if that's what the sound calls for. Sure. So we're following the sound as much as our, you know, kind of intent duly. Right. Very cool. Um, thank you for all that. Um, yeah. and then tonight you said you would play something that is not of yet course. released. Yeah. It's going to be something we're going to record in about a month or two. That's awesome. So it kind of, I guess it makes, I didn't really think about this until you asked me the question in the interview, but sort of like how we did a LP and an EP when we first debuted this band six years yep. ago, we're about to record an EP and an LP and release it in the opposite order uh, <laughs> as soon as we can. So probably early next year. Right. So we're back on the train of putting out a lot of music at once which is um, one of the perks of not having a record label or a manager to tell you that you can't, it's too much too soon. Um, <laughs> so as a completely independent artist, we can do whatever the hell we want. And it's kind yep, of nice yep, sometimes. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's, you know, we wish we had a bigger team, but also at times like this, when I want to put out, you know, 14 songs that aren't on the same release within the same couple months, 
um, you know, people can tell me it's not the best idea, but I can just do it anyway. So <laughs> I don't mind that either. No, I totally, totally agree. And I admire that as well. But uh, <laughs> not that we're not looking, but, you know, it'd have to be the right situation. Yeah. And even though you said you didn't want to Dylan people, you're going to be dealing them with uh, harmonica and guitar. That's true. That's and true. Bang and vocals. All right. So David and I'll come off screen. We'll give you center stage. And uh, you can uh, set up the song, give people the title, and uh, and we will tease the heck out of them so that they can be looking forward to this one. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's going to be on our next LP, our next full length of original material. And this is a song that I wrote only a couple of months ago. It's very new. James immediately greenlit it, so I was excited about that. And I played at Rocks Borough Manny on Porch Fest last weekend. And I played this song in front of some neighbors and some friends and family and our friend's five-year-old daughter said it was her favorite one i played so that means i guess we can keep it in the in the set list here and this song is called hammer and um it's about a hammer that's not a hammer and it goes like this This hammer from my father Swung it every single day Keep it underneath my bed now Never give that thing away Cause when I need a little rhythm I'm afraid that I might fall Go and reach into that toolbox, put a nail into the wall. He was a framer in his younger days. His crew could really house get the floor joist down in no time tell the inside and the out when the press how the roof beams crude let out a wind sweat of working men and women as every hammer needs a nail Take out his hammer, build little precious things. Some go down and fall flat, some of them really ring like a plane needs wings, like a ship needs to sail. Got this hammer from my Father, every hammer needs a nail. This hammer from my father, every hammer needs a Yeah, that was Thanks. really great. Thank you for sharing that. And Thank the sound so was 
awesome. Like you said, if we want to use that for the recording, you can have it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's yet to be seen. You know, uh, Springsteen went to the studio and re-recorded every track on Nebraska and ended up using the cassette tape in his back pocket from his bedroom. So you never know. How it's you never go. know. That's where I am right now. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it sounded awesome. And what a beautiful song. Um, wanted to touch on one quick thing. Um, and this is on your site. So I figure uh, it's, it's cool to highlight and uh, it's got to be yeah. elsewhere out there. But this is um, an article you wrote about failure. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was a while and, ago. Yeah. And I just think it's really neat um, because you were asked to write like a bio and you tried like you started and stopped a bunch of times. And what you just decided to write was more about the the definition of success or failure as an independent artist and yeah um i just thought like just real quick i'll actually i have a screenshot of it here sure. and i thought this was such an interesting port, uh, part of it um and it was it kind of after you talk through the different parts and what made me even think about it even more was earlier you talked about those uh un, unresponded to cold emails is is referenced in the article at an earlier point right but in this middle section here you know, you say that, uh, you know, at some point you're going to tell yourself that you're going to get the job that makes more money and leaves you with no energy to worry about creating something lasting against the fact that in the end, it's all temporary. All washes away, even pyramids and thumb drives, which I think is great wording. <laughs> then I wake up a day or so later and it leaves me. I pick up my guitar and it feels like it did when I was 11, when my dad was still alive. And I walk outside and the way the light shines through the trees makes me cry. And I hit record and I make something up and I feel otherworldly tug on something invisible inside of me. And then I go to work at the academy I teach at and finish a song with a kid who has no idea about limitations and long nights and what it takes and what it's like to have no safety net and watch them fearlessly write and sing their heart out. And I think, is this failure? And I just wanted to stop there. I thought that's such a beautiful way to look at it all, where it's like even where you have get landed is still such a beautiful success and you still have so much more going on too. But I mean, just in this moment, I don't know. I thought the way that you wrote that article was just such a very cool way to kind of just achieve peace with where the universe has brought you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. I haven't thought about that or even reread that in maybe five, four years or five years, but yeah, I was told I could write anything for this uh, mainly like a, like a fashion and high art photography magazine that was being printed at the time by friends in New York city. And yeah, after trying to like, it says in the beginning of the article, trying to like think of something clever or cool or write some kind of like, you know, Hunter S. Thompson esque, like, right. you know, road story that I always dreamt of writing for someone. Like I just ended up writing about stuff that had been on my mind. I've been thinking about endlessly, like things you think about in the car on the way back sure. to the gigs. Yep, and things whether when it's a good gig or not a particularly good gig or all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, you know, my dad was also a musician and he was a music teacher uh, as well in a different way. He was a middle school band director who gigged on nights and weekends. Um, <laughs> and you know, I just saw a lot of a different example of what success could mean, I guess, and like never applied it to myself until one day you just kind of see it in a different way. Um, and you know, do I think I've, you know. It's just, yeah, the things that look like failures are not. That's like the main point of it, I guess. And, you know, again, if I could write a song to just one person, even if it's in my own hometown, it really means something to them. And that's like, that's the actual end goal, especially totally. if I'm going to call myself a folk songwriter, because that's what <laughs> folk music is, is songs for the people immediately around you and, mm -hmm. until it got commercialized and became a great genre, which it is. Sure. But so many of the folk singers originally were just people that only played on their porch or in their backyard. Sure. Um, so yeah, like the idea of the musician in that context is so different, but it's still entertainment at the end of the day. But thank Absolutely. you for bringing that up because that kind of, yeah, even hearing it now, it hits me in a different way that maybe I need to reread that and tell myself that again. Um, but totally. yeah, no, it's yeah, on the yeah. website and I've left it up there for a reason, I guess. So you check it out. I gotta, <laughs> I'm going to add my new book soon, not the whole text of it, but that's going to be the next thing in the writing section. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I appreciate that. No, yeah, my pleasure. I, I found it and it struck me. Um, and again, like, you, you know, if you perception, the way you view how it's going can just frame whether or not it's viewed as failure or success and to not forget, you know, these small moments that are so important, like, you know, tapping into a child's talent or, 
you know, just simply enjoying a beautiful day. Like it's, that's just huge. So anyway, um, yeah. I just thought it was a great article. And again, mm -hmm. we'll link to it so that people can read the whole thing um, and, and uh, kind of capture everything you were looking to, to kind of share in that moment. But, uh, sure. but let's also, uh, you know, promote some stuff. Um, you had talked about some of the shows you had done this summer. There's a bunch more coming up here. Oh, I wanted to mention this one too. Um, you guys have performed with a bunch of really, really cool artists. Um, but this past summer, you actually performed with Jason Isbell, right? Yeah, yeah, we were lucky. That must to, have been uh, really dope. <laughs> it was a really, really great concert. It was at the Stone mm -hmm. Pony, which is you know we grew up as teenagers and all through our twenties playing music in Asbury Park before right. and since its renaissance as a great place to go listen to music. Yeah, um, and yeah, we were lucky enough to have one of the opening support slots for him. Yeah, and, and then uh, you're that was not that long ago. You're headlining there coming up. Yeah, so November for the 5th, first time in your, which seems hard to believe, but your first time headlining the Stone Pony. Yeah, so yeah, we're selling tickets currently right now. Um, anyone's interested, you can just contact us directly. Our website, which is just jacksonpines.com, there's a contact page or our email, mm -hmm. which is just jacksonpinesmusic at gmail.com. Right. And yeah, we're really excited. All the years, like we used to do matinees, like I said, emo bands, punk bands, my high school band, then my other band. Now, yeah. Finally, after that, Jason Isbell show, our set, we did well. It was a really great crowd, uh, and they immediately asked if we wanted to do another one. So we're putting together a great card. Our drummer is primarily a singer-songwriter in his own right, Cranston mm -hmm. Dean. He played mandolin when you saw us. He's a great Swiss Army knife. He can play mandolin and do harmonies at an acoustic show. He can play drums and harmonies at a full band show. He's also his own act, so he's going to open up the night and then Sean Tobin and the Boardwalk Fire, great new Asbury band. They just put up their first record, I think. Uh, nice. They're going to play as well. And then we're going to play our headlining set. We're really excited. We have some guests going to join us and play some new songs like that, but also play the records. Not all mm -hmm. of them straight through, but most of the important ones. Yep. And then, of course, uh, we were lucky enough that um, one of Nina Simone's grandchildren, cool. Alexander Simone, is going to play the final set and close out the night. He's got a great rock, soul I mean, an amazing group called Alexander Simone and Houdat Live Crew. And they're going to like close out the night. Uh, it's going to be like a big, fun you know, party at the end. And I might join them for a song or two as well. And we're just going to kind of bring back that old energy when people would just jam with each other at the pump. Jam, yeah. That's so but cool. But with our own sound, mm -hmm. our own music, right. not the one which we love, but we don't recreate that old sound. Sure. <laughs> And that, just to remind everybody, that's November 5th. The 5th of November. Yep. There's exactly. also, um, before that one, you're playing the White Song Preserve on October 22nd. Yeah, so, so this, up soon. this Saturday, it's the yeah. White's Bog Preservation Trust, and it's actually where the blueberry was first domesticated and cultivated in the whole world. So that's... The amount uh, of history we're getting in this episode. Yeah, really. Is, we're going to charge like people. A, I mean, this scientific and historic information coming out of this. Uh, podcast, this episode could go on just... Khan Academy at this point. I was going to I was going to originally I originally wanted to be a theoretical physicist. But my dad and I had so much music in my life that when things your experiences in your life experiences shift you, you know what you're supposed to do. Sure. Um, but I'm really huge into the history. Obviously, I studied musicology. I just actually went I dropped out to be in my first band after high school. And then went back only a couple of years ago and got a, a degree actually in the history of music. So it's a big thing in what we do. Um, and that's why we're playing at White's Bog on this Saturday, the 22nd, is because they preserve the history of New Jersey Pine Barrens cultivation. So blueberries went from being wild to being domesticated. And they and that's where Ocean Spray first started, like, oh, you know, cool. doing the, you know, cranberries and blueberries. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be playing our original music. But also, we spent the last year learning some actual, legit New Jersey folk music. Um, I've done a lot of research. Uh, there was a family down there that recorded and wrote stuff in the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. We learned a bunch of that stuff. And our new EP is actually going to be four New Jersey folk songs, our interpretations awesome. of them. Awesome. Two from those dudes. One that's an old 1800s New Jersey folk song. Oh, and one awesome. that goes back to Scotland, like the 1400s, but was collected by a Lomax like person, uh, Dorothea Dix Lawrence in New Jersey in the forties. So we're all wrapped up in this, uh, as well. So we kind of keep one foot in the, um, you know, music industry and one foot in the like kind of more Smithsonian academic world. Maybe mm -hmm. that's, you know, to our detriment, but you know what, again, no manager, no label, no one can tell me what to do. So exactly. No, no, you don't, you don't question that for one second. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's this Saturday, the 22nd. 20 then the yeah. 5th of November is the Stone Pony show we talked yeah. about. November 11th at Beach House Brewery. Yes. 
And then November 12th is the other one we kind of teased a little bit, the Grape Room, where you're also performing with the Tisberries. Yeah, really excited for that. I live in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I actually live only a couple blocks from the Grape Room, so it's the best commute in my whole world of music. (laughs) Yeah, gotta love that, right? I go out the door, I carry my amp in my case, and that's it. Um, (laughs) And if you forget something, you go back and get it. Yeah, I'll be right back. (laughs) And that's happened, so it was great. (laughs) <laughs> um, but we're really excited. Two New Jersey bands that we know. They're coll- I mean, they're um, acquaintances and a couple friends of ours are in those bands as well. Little Hag. They're signed to Barn on Records. They're really amazing from Asbury. Mm-hmm. And also Yawn Mower. Um, they're uh, from New Jersey as well. And they're really great. They're on tour together. So that's their tour stop. And then never played with the Tisberries before. And we're glad finally to be able to play with them because they're a great Philadelphia band that just put out an amazing record. Um, so it's a stacked night at the Grape Room yes. on the yeah. 12th. Tisberries are great. They absolutely are. So that would just to see the both of you, uh, that alone would have been worth it. And then to throw in some of those other great artists is a, definitely a night to, to for people to consider getting out for. It's going to be great if you're in mm-hmm. Pennsylvania to go to the Grape Room. Yeah. Very cool venue, too. Well, Joe, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Thanks for having me. I really and, appreciate uh, it. And sharing not only your own personal history, but New Jersey history and blueberry history and... <laughs> It awesome. all comes with the territory, man. I'm like half blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so I'm going to salt and roll away. We're That's right. Really <laughs> and, and also, thank you so much for performing tonight. That was uh, stunning. It was really uh, wonderful to have that. That was a lovely a song. Thank show. you. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So best of luck to you. And, uh, and thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. David. Philip, that was another success. I know. I feel like... I, I feel smarter. I feel uh, more at peace. Um, more. I feel like I want some dessert. And, like and the that. blueberry thing. Yeah, blueberry, blueberry pie tart, is, I think, course. maybe my top three desserts on the entire planet. Really? Yeah, I love blueberries. They're delicious. Maybe it's because I've got family that probably came from New Jersey at one point in time. Yeah, there's definitely something there. He mentioned Scottish, so... Well, that's that. right up there. <laughs> I'm screwed. <laughs> no, I was meaning that... Maybe no, I meant better. the blueberry thing. I got no yeah. choice. Yeah, there you go. Um, but anyway, uh, super excited for this episode to uh, to to kind of be out there, and um, can't wait to to check out some more Jackson Pines. Yeah, outstanding. Everyone should be busting down the doors to see. Absolutely. All right, Phil. Let's say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> We once again hope you enjoyed this episode of Your Next Favorite Band. We'd like to sincerely thank Joe McAvecki and uh, and even James Black uh, in absentia uh, for for their wonderful music, their uh, commitment to uh, you know just delivering amazing songs as well as to terrific performances, um, and uh, you know just sharing all that stories about how they came to be and their songwriting process. And and thank you again, Joe, for for performing tonight. It was wonderful. Um, There'll be links in the show notes, too. Uh, There'll be a lot of them this time. Uh, Website, Spotify, YouTube, Bandcamp, uh, as well as to the article we shared. If anything, we can find about Alan Lomax uh, sharing the the very, very cool uh, history of the different types of guitar playing and songwriting uh, from the the Appalachian Mountains and all that good stuff that was very, very cool to learn about. And can't wait to research some of that more. Um, as always, uh, our hope here is to bring in your next favorite band. And if you happen to know Jackson Pines, and that's what tuned you in, that uh, we thank you very much for that. We hope that you subscribe, like, and follow us on, on social media. And we may be able to introduce you to some uh, new next favorite bands. Um, we got a lot of great stuff coming up. And uh, if nothing else, we also hope that we can take in a live show together. And uh, we can't wait for the next one. It's all over now. Whee! <laughs>